The Lord be with you. The Collect for the Fifth Sunday of Lent. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not with them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going out to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, 
see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've just heard the story of the raising of Lazarus from the Gospel according to John. And it's significant that in this Sunday's readings, it is paired with the vision of the prophet Ezekiel, the valley of dry and disarticulated bones. If you can't bring that story easily to mind, then have a look at Ezekiel chapter 37 and the first 14 verses. Dry bones are scattered across a valley floor, the shattered remains of a nation. They cry out to the Lord, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off completely. With a third of the world's population in lockdown, it is tempting to see everything that we are so familiar with, all the things that give our lives colour and shape, turning to dust, the mere dry bones of the life we enjoyed only a few short weeks ago. God questions Ezekiel. Can these bones live? And Ezekiel, who has no resources of his own to change the situation, simply replies, O Lord God, you know. Then God says to the prophet, prophesy to these bones, prophesy to the breath that comes from the four winds. Breathe to make these bones live again, to be the people God calls his own. This is not the breath of panic or the breath of exhaustion, but the measured and steady breath of God, breathing upon his creation to make all things new once again. God has the power to turn death into life. God has the power to turn the dead and dying soul into a newly living person, refreshed and renewed. God has the power to recreate the heart of a nation. Jesus comes to Bethany, to the home of Martha and Mary, to console them on the death of Lazarus, his friend and their brother. He has not rushed there. When he heard the news of Lazarus's illness and impending death, he doesn't go as perhaps we would as quickly as he could, at least we would do so under normal circumstances. He has continued to be about his ministry in the place where he is. And it's only two days later that he sets out and the disciples warn him of the danger of returning to Judea. Out there are people who would happily stone him for what he is saying and doing, for to them it is blasphemy and deserves extreme punishment. And it's in the face of this danger that Thomas, and yes, that is the supposedly doubting Thomas, Thomas affirms his faith in Jesus. Let us go with him, that we may die with him. So whatever Jesus chooses to do, rush to Martha and Mary's side, stay to complete his work, or walk into danger, 
None of these things is an easy choice. But what he does do, what he does, is to follow God's purpose for him. He sees all things through a greater and God-given perspective. Jesus does not panic at the impending death of a friend, nor does he panic at the deadly threats offered to him. His breathing and his actions are measured and paced. There is a word of life to share and a profound calling to see through to the end. And lest we think that Jesus is uncaring or too much focused on himself and not on others, we see that when he comes to Bethany, he is overcome with emotion. He weeps with Martha and Mary. He weeps with the mourners. He weeps, no doubt, for his own loss too. And the reaction of his friends and their comforters is mixed, even conflicted. See how he loved him. But also, couldn't he have got here earlier and prevented this? There is undoubtedly pain and loss in this story. There's undoubtedly pain and loss for many in this time of pandemic. Some of it is seen by us all on the news reports, but for many it will touch and continue to touch our families and our friends too. Who knows the extent of this and for how long it will last? Fears of illness, of job losses, uncertain futures and crippled hopes. These may well lead us to cry out like the dry bones in the valley, or even ask from the heart, could not God prevent this? And that last question is perhaps impossible to answer. But as far as I understand the ways of God in scripture and in my own life, God does not step in to prevent things or to turn us away from bad choices and wrong actions, except by his constant and persistent word, his breath of life. And then the choice is ours and there are consequences whichever way we go. Most often, for me at least, and I think for many others too, the question is the other way round. When something happens, good or bad, joyful or sad, God says, this has happened, this is how things are, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to live for me in this? When Jesus brought back his friend Lazarus, he gave him and those around him a new opportunity. It would not last forever. Lazarus, Martha and Mary all die and depart from this mortal existence. But they have the chance to redeem things and change things, at least for a while. And what they did together in this moment of opportunity, we just don't know. It's not recorded because the Gospels focus on Jesus. Did they say things that had long gone unsaid or assumed? Did they positively value things that they had always taken for granted? Did they have a renewed compassion for others suffering loss? Who knows? Yet the raising of Lazarus is a sign and symbol to us of the possibility of new things. It doesn't change everything and make everything better, but it signals the power and the will of God to bring life out of death, health and well-being out of destruction, hope out of disaster. And while we are all confined more or less to our homes, these are things, I think, for us all to ponder upon. These are things for our country and the nations of the world to think upon. For when this pandemic comes to an end, the question is, will we rush to make things just as they were before? Will we almost panic to shore up our familiar ways that we can pretend that nothing really happened? Or will we take a breath? breathe more steadily and ask ourselves just what kind of a world, what kind of a society, what kind of a relationship with others do we really want and really need? Just before we were swept up in this present crisis, most of the world at last 
was paying renewed and real attention to the harm we're doing to the earth and to each other by our unseemingly unlimited desire to consume. A hopeful consequence of what is happening now is that air pollution is seriously diminished and the earth has a small window to breathe again. Will we follow this up in the years to come? I hope so. Will we heed God's word and breathe it in as life for us and for our neighbours? I pray so. Will each of us have the courage to take a breath and be honest about what we really need and who we really are meant to be. I hope and pray so. Can these bones live? Yes, they can. For those who can hear the word of God, this is true. Listen, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act. Amen. We end with the blessing. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son. He is the sacrifice for our sins, that we might live through him. If God loves us so much, we ought to love one another. If we love one another, God lives in us. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love, now and always. Amen.